faculty, staff, students, and guests. Good afternoon again, and welcome to the plenary session of the UWM faculty meeting. My name is John Boyland, and I welcome you as President Pro Tem of the Faculty Senate. Our main speaker for this plenary session is Chancellor Mark Money. Um, Mark, can you come up on stage? Please welcome Chancellor Money. Thank you for the introduction, John, and good afternoon. Um, isn't it wonderful that we're celebrating this year our 60th anniversary? This is wonderful. What you see on the slide here is our alumni house more than 60 years ago, and the next picture shows the Kenwood Interdisciplinary Research Complex today, which is representative, symbolic, I think, of much of the progress that we have made. This is a picture of a lot of the activities from the fall welcome week, and it serves as a great welcome, a great uh, way for me to say, we're back in session. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of enthusiasm with our students back, and I'm pleased to be able to present to you the fall plenary 2016, and uh, know that I will share with you uh, ample information, provide uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. The title of my talk is Building on 60 Years of Accomplishments, Actions for a Sustainable Future. I'll cover those two themes. It's really uh, quite simple. Um, in the first theme, celebrating our 60th anniversary, I will talk about our accomplishments, impacts, and commitments. In the second area, I'll talk about the actions underway to sustain the momentum that we've achieved. Our budget, enrollment, climate, and culture are the primary areas that I'll talk about. We'll provide time for a Q&A. Editorial overview before we get into the substance. I think you'll find my comments to be celebratory, very proud, especially in the first half, but I think you'll also find a very serious commitment to the actions that we have to undertake. I think, as you know, it hasn't been easy. In fact, I would argue it's not easy anywhere in higher education today for reasons that you're well aware of, but I'll articulate a few more to set an important foundation for the context that we're in. But also a resolve, a resolve to continue to build on the great strengths that this campus has. I also want to stress that more than ever, we need to do this together and I need your help. With that said, let me take a quick look back. We've had many transformative events in our history, even before we became UWM. In fact, we started as Wisconsin Normal School in 1885. We became, in 1922, Wisconsin's Teachers College. In 1940s, we became Wisconsin State University, and only in 1956 did we become UW-Milwaukee. I have an article from 1956 that you see a picture of in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. You can't read it, of course, from there, but you might be able to see the title. It says, New Institution Defies Biologist Theories. It just keeps growing and going along. What this article talks about is that biologists hold that a cell, as it grows, gets to a certain size, it divides, and those cells go on and have their own lives, and this continues. But this, the opposite, happened with UW-Milwaukee. We were, as I mentioned in 1940s, Wisconsin State College. We joined with the UW-Madison Extension in 1956 to form UWM. I'd like to read to you the last two sentences of this article because it really sets a great stage for our comments and our future. The growth of both schools has been rapid in the past several years, and the feeling grew that they should merge in order to provide a well-balanced four-year degree-granting institution. The idea, this idea has been accomplished, and from henceforth, history will be written by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, a union of two growing cells. I think it's fantastic, and as we look back, the history has been written, and what are we today? What are we today, if nothing, but an organization that has met remarkable challenges will continue to meet many more. We are today a Research One University. What an incredible success. We have 180,000 alumni. The et cetera that you see here is not just a throwaway abbreviation. I'm going to share with you what I mean specifically by that et cetera in a few more slides. There's quite a bit that we have accomplished and it is truly remarkable. So we have done incredible things and we have truly defied the biologist's uh, perspective on, on uh, uh, the issue of growth. 
As we celebrate UWM today, I'd like to share with you a few what's, a few things that truly are uh, significant. And these are recent events. This year alone, we had a first. Three NSF major instrumentation grants were given to UWM. Scientists, two were in physics. This is, um, we have, have uh, uh, Patrick Brady and Valley Raku, and then chemistry, Peter Geisinger have received those three uh, major instrumentation grants. In the campus overall, we had been for the last several years a top 50 LGBT plus campus. A month ago, we had moved up into the top 30 LGBT plus campuses. In part because of the work from our military and veterans resource center, we, Maverick is what it's known as, we have become listed on the Department of Education's eight websites for success for veterans in the United States. We have been viewed over a million times now for our websites, and we have been listed as praiseworthy for our Twitter messaging and larger communication campaign with the R1 communication plan as an extensive part of our communications overall. We're one of only seven universities to have received nationally a U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Award for our work on sustainability. Our campaign in the last year, last year alone, raised $29 million. We have achieved thus far in the quiet phase still $114 million, well on our way to 175, potentially going uh, beyond that goal. One of the significant examples was just this week where John Shannon and Jan Sayre, a Peck School of the Arts double Panther alumni, were able to bestow upon us a million dollar gift that will enhance the Kenilworth Building showcase for art and design on the sixth floor. It's a remarkable accomplishment and it's one that's rooted rooted not just in terms of alumni depth, but the wonderful understanding of what this university is all about and what it does, and the momentum remains strong. We have many, many areas that, that um, I would, would add to this um, in terms of, of uh, as we celebrate UWM today, that includes a reflection on our character. Many campuses are struggling, and the nation, frankly, is grappling with the issue of civil discourse. There was an article that came out this summer in Time Magazine, which is pictured here, and it was headlined, The Revolution on America's Campuses, and it described how we haven't seen the level of unrest since the 1960s on college campuses. On this campus, we are celebrating free speech. We have had the difficult conversations, and we will have more. We have had presidential candidates, we have had debates, we've had town halls. I imagine there will be more. We are hosting on October 5th the Imagining America President's Council. This is a group that has a number of individuals that participate from a leadership, campus presidents, faculty leaders, community members who are dedicated to using the programs and using the campuses to enhance the lives in urban environments. We also, on October 13, will be hosting the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. So indeed, we are engaged. We are doing a number of things as we proceed in our, in our uh, contemporary times. The impact of UWM is tremendous on a number of different levels. We have done much in terms of, of uh, uh, individual transformation. We have done much in terms of organization and community levels through our roles that our graduates play collectively. In fact, it's almost daily that I interact with an employer who tells me that we provide the most talent of any educational institution in the state. And it's remarkable as we think about our 180,000 alumni, where they go, what they contribute. But it's not just in Wisconsin that we have impact. It's in the larger region, it's at the state, national, and international level through our research, through our discovery, and through our global reach. There's a challenge that I'd like to share with you in light of our 60th anniversary. We have partnered with a number of different community organizations, different parts of UWM, and we ask students, faculty, and staff to complete 60,000 hours of community engagement. To put this in perspective, every year we give 43,000 hours across our campus. 
We can do this, and the website for tracking and for having the forms uh, to, to keep, keep this um, front, front uh, of mind and, and front and center is at the bottom. This is through Siebler, or our Center for Community-Based Learning, Leadership, and Research website. To put this in perspective, I welcomed our D1 athletes back to campus on Monday night. Those 300 athletes every year put forth 4,000 hours of community service. I think we can hit 60,000. That's a great, great opportunity. So across every school and college, we've accomplished a tremendous amount. I would like to give examples from every school and college, and there are so many. I'll just give a sampling with apologies. In our College of Engineering and Applied Science, we have an industrial assessment center pictured here. This is an energy savings program where faculty and students go into companies and audit them for their energy usage. This program, over the last few years, has allowed companies to save almost $7 million. We just got a renewal from the Department of Energy for another three years. So this is a powerful type of partnership. In the college, in the Lubar School of Business, we have executive education programs that have educated thousands of individuals that enable those companies to strengthen their operations to maintain even more economic prosperity and talent development in this region. They don't have to go anywhere else. We've got great programs right here. In our Peck School of the Arts, we have over 300 live music, dance, theater, all sorts of different events on and off campus that engage the community. We have in our School of Architecture and Urban Planning a Community Design Solutions Center which serves underserved communities, agencies, civic groups, and others with preliminary design and planning services that promote positive change. Every semester in our School of Information Studies, we have what's called nonprofit. The IT is capitalized for the IT functions that are performed. And this is an example of for a Native American tribe in Wisconsin, the redesign and complete uh, re rework of their website. It's just wonderful to hear the presentations where there's faculty and community organizations that help with the mentoring of our students and great faculty engagement. I'd like to highlight an example and put special emphasis on something that's happening in the College of Letters and Science. Professor Richard Leeson has shared with me some work that's happening in art history. We are now placing graduate students at major arts institutions in the Milwaukee area, including the Milwaukee Museum of Wisconsin Art, I apologize, it's the Museum of Wisconsin Art, the Haggerty Museum of Art in, at Marquette, Kohler Foundation, and as of spring 2017, to be housed at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Why that's so important is that is emphasizing an element that's critical when we think about student success, and that is preparation for life after graduation. I'll talk about other dimensions of student success later in this talk, but I really applaud this effort. It's fundamentally important and, and, and uh, uh, wonderful to have heard about. Thank you for sharing that uh, with me. I want to talk a little bit about something that we have referred to as SAJEC. SAJEC stands for Social Entrepreneurship, Justice, and Equity Compact. This is a group of faculty and staff that have been working for the last year, headed by Dean Scott Emmons and Professor Rob Smith under the guidance and executive sponsorship of Dr. Joan Prince, to work on campus initiatives to help coordinate and focus the work that we're doing in urban areas. Specifically, we have received $300,000 in funding from the president of UW System to be earmarked to see if we can move the needle on specific outcomes in the Milwaukee area. That's the graphic that you see at the bottom of the slide where there's a needle being moved. We have awarded a, a significant amount of that money to eight different mini-grants. And these mini-grants, you probably saw the, the call for, for the grants. Uh, we had, I think, 24 or 25 applications from which we selected the top eight from a peer-reviewed um, panel. And those eight projects have partnerships that are vital, that include some of these uh, types of outcomes. Providing stress management skills to those in poverty. Making inroads to end homelessness in Milwaukee improving community access for persons with disabilities, reducing energy costs of low-income households through cooperative energy sharing, helping Milwaukee County women transition to life after imprisonment, 
providing assessment and evaluation to help women out of poverty, teaching inner city high school students about sustainable food systems in the growing urban ag market, and expanding neighborhood job placement and financial coaching services. The other activities that are campus-wide include our work on M cubed. M cubed stands for Milwaukee Public Schools, Milwaukee Area Technical College, and UWM working together exponentially to grow and strengthen the pipeline of successful students. The three institutions that I just mentioned represent 143,000 students. We are the largest public institutions serving Wisconsin residents, and if we link together, the difference is profound. If we don't work together, the consequences are grim. If you look at the graduation rates and if you look at what's going on across the state, what we can do to fuel the state with more successful graduates from a prosperity, giving a stronger future, is phenomenal. So that's a huge commitment that the institutional leaders have, have uh, committed to. And we will be having a public launch on October 26th. More details will be forthcoming. We most likely will be having this at the UW-Milwaukee Panther Arena. There are over 110 individuals that work across five goal groups that have been making great progress. And you will hear an update, and you'll hear about some of the commitment that, that has been made with existing resources and some of the new financial resources uh, that we're seeking. So we have made an impact. I've talked about a number of different programs with apologies to so many hundreds of different things that cannot be recognized simply due to time. But I'd like to share with you from the students' words some of the impact that we've had on them, their organizations, and broader community. And here, I can guarantee you, every single school and college is represented. Without the knowledge and instruction and professors that I encountered and had the privilege to work with at UWM, I would not be where I am today. UWM offered me an opportunity to move from a small town in Wisconsin to Milwaukee and get exposed to an urban environment and all the challenges that urban environments face. To me, having an impact on the community is the reason I get up and come to work every day. Works is so um, entrenched in the community. Our work is driven by our connection to the community, and UWM connected me to the community, and connected me to other dancers, connected me to Milwaukee Ballet, connected me to this work, to this position. And it's the connection piece that is at the core of what UWM's impact has been on my life. When I think of Milwaukee, UWM is one of the things that pops up. I feel like a part of it, like that's my community when I'm walking through the halls of UWM. Without that supportive, caring staff, I wouldn't be where I am today. As one professor uh, told me back when I was a young student, she said, you know what, you're talking loud and saying nothing. And what that meant was you can scream and holler and talk about things that need to change, but are you going to be a part of the change or one who witnesses the change? And I decided to be a part of the change, and that I learned through my work at UWM. I've established collaborations of my background at School of Freshwater Sciences that are paying dividends in terms of the work that I do and work that I know needs to be done. Being here in Racine and working with the Racine Health Department where probably at least half of the staff there come from UWM. So it's almost like wherever I go, I bump into alumni. And to me, it tells me that the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee is right at that cutting edge and is establishing those connections with the communities. Going back to UWM for my master's in nursing with the community focus, particularly here at the UWM Nursing Centers. It was just something that was really a blessing. If I can give back to the community and, you know, do nursing is what I love to do and do that in a profession I love to do, that's gold. I think that UWM and the city fought hard to have the School of Public Health here, and I think it's evident that we need more public health professionals, and UWM is helping to make that happen. UWM 
interviewing and being a research university and my natural curiosity about all things information, just being at UWM was instrumental in my thinking patterns and the way that I manage and secure library services for just such a, an institution as MATC. The things that make me passionate about it are, are the people that I work with, the patients. I think without them, you know, I wouldn't have as near as much drive to do what I do. UWM helped me get where I am today. UWM has been a critical part of Milwaukee and continues to be a critical part of Milwaukee, helping with social problems, business problems, and lots of other things that I'm sure I don't even know. You know, I'm in the business of infrastructure, and you look at what's been built in Milwaukee, some of the most iconic landmarks. Those are built by UWM graduates. You look at the Market Interchange, the new art museum in Milwaukee, Miller Park, the new skyscraper going up for Northwestern Mutual. Those are all projects that UWM engineers played a large role in, and that's what makes me proud as a UWM graduate. I think what makes me most proud of being a UWM alum is that we are committed to the, the city of Milwaukee, and I want to continue to be in that fight with UWM. I want this to be something that really emboldens and brings up Milwaukee. This is an amazing, it's an amazing place to live and work. Well, that video, in a way, says it all. At the risk of uh, getting myself in a little deeper, I will add a few more comments. But I, I have to tell you, we have a remarkable team that has helped put this together. That includes Mary and Chris Baylor, Chris Lago, and Kyle Bursa. Um, they have done a, a wonderful job, as, as always, on, on this and many other video projects. And I'd also like to acknowledge, while I'm uh, acknowledging individuals, we have four people from our Accessibility Resource Center here today, and they're doing signing, and we're very grateful for their work. They include uh, Shannon, Cassie, Barb, and Liz. Let's give them a, a round of applause for their work. I have to say, um, while they're in academic affairs, we do have the only American Sign Language program four-year degree in the state, and it's just another example of the remarkable, unique uh, things that we do that nobody else in this state does. So as we look back and are about to look forward at how we sustain many of these things, we need to look at the situation that we're in right now and, and recognize a number of things about UWM, our unique qualities. And we know this. We know that we have invested in, created a culture of, and are committed to student success, research, civic engagement, and campus and community partnerships. These are bedrock. Our campus is built around a balanced portfolio. It's all of those things together. And as much as it's a, a somewhat trite phrase, I think it's easy to recognize that the whole of UWM is much greater simply than a listing of the parts, a listing of the, the different so-called assets that we have. It really is synergistic on this campus. So, it's in that context that I look at our future and I, looked at, I look at our, our current situation in the future and think hard about this as another defining moment in the context of who we are and where we need to go to face the challenges that are facing higher education today. I list some of them, not all of them, but I list some of them. And let me just talk about the interrelated and challenging nature of these things. In the world of technology, we just accomplished this week thanks to a remarkable UITS team, the 53rd or 54th building on our campus that now has Wi-Fi access. This was a project that started in 2009 on a budget for 10 million, on a budget for 10 buildings that was accomplished with over 50 buildings on the same budget. This is an, a remarkable engagement, but at the same time, we're asking UW System for almost another $10 million for IT network infrastructure. When I'm in Washington, D.C. last week, and I'm in, when I'm in Madison and I'm dealing with elected officials, parents, business leaders, faculty, staff, students, and others, they ask all the time about technology. We know technology in two basic domains. One is to do our everyday business of being a university. My email, 
our payroll accounting, the types of things that we do all sorts of work on technology for in our, in our research labs and, and whatnot. There's also, though, the curriculum side. And the curriculum side is changing so dramatically that we see growth in universities around the world. We hear about MOOCs, the massive online open enrollment courses. We see how our enrollments, I see how my son's programs at his time in UWM over a six year period that is undergraduate and master's degree went from no classes online to virtually half of them. I look at the changes that are happening and the expenses involved and then how that's interrelated is I have additional sets of questions where people come and say, do we really need all the bricks and mortar because of all of that technology? These are fundamental, profound questions when you start talking about per square footage allocation of space and a state government that has said, we have concerns about the debt load, the capital requests and the infrastructure. Witness last biennial budget, where you saw for the first time in history, a dramatic reduction, significant. I'm not talking about 30 or 50% in terms of statistical significant, I'm talking about as in 80 to 90% less than what the previous capital budgets had been. Let's put this in UWM context. We had received over the last 10 years, every biennial budget between 70 and $90 million. Every biennial budget in terms of capital expansion. That came to a, a very, very quick stop with the last biennial budget. And so as we look ahead to the next ones, we don't know, is this a one time? Is this a temporary pause? Or is this business uh, the new reality? We'll find out uh, in, the, in the future, and I'll talk more about several of our budget uh, issues. I think we just lost our, uh, our uh, uh, it's back, okay. Um, we'll, we'll find out. That wasn't for dramatic pause. That, 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 that comes later. Um, so so let, me, let me keep going. This is just in the technology world. You see how interrelated it is, though, to issues that, that quickly uh, go into that. Issues of student debt and affordability. We have, and you've seen in the last couple of weeks, a lot of press, locally and nationally, about this issue. Student debt, we know, on average, when students graduate with an undergraduate, is 31,000 and change. In Wisconsin, it's higher, and at UWM, it's even a little higher. Part of that is because of the student population that we serve. This question, though, has achieved incredible attention, and that's one of the reasons why we have had four years of tuition freeze and we may well have another two years of tuition freeze. More on that a little bit later. The state funding is such that across the country, as a national phenomenon, we have seen public universities receive from their states less and less funding virtually every year. As challenging as it is in Wisconsin, it's worse in, in some other states, but it's not something to be proud of where we are relative to that. But the point is, there are books written today about the plight in higher education. One of them is called Public No More. It's actually been out for four or five years, and it describes and documents this phenomenon, and we all know and, and see the effects of this. Demographics are not necessarily our friend in the context of 1,000 to 1,200 fewer high school students every year in Wisconsin for the last six years, and that's projected to continue for a couple more years. There's many other aspects of demographics that, that do provide some opportunities. Accountability is a word that I don't use lightly. Accountability is a throwaway word a lot of times. It's just something we all ought to be attentive to. But I received this week from the Department of Education the latest U.S. college scorecard. And this is getting more and more attention, and every school and college ultimately will be evaluated at the federal level. At the state level, we had Act 55 in the last biennial budget that required us to put online 12 accountability metrics, a scorecard, if you will. Governor Walker has said that any additional increases in UW system funding will be tied to performance-based funding, accountability, front and center. We, were achie we achieved Higher Learning Commission accreditation last year, and every one of the accreditors, when they were in, were surprised that we did not have performance-based funding because almost all of their states have gone to that. So this is a reality. This is something that is that, whether we like it or not, this is one of those things that is fundamental. And we're not going to go back. The world has changed so profoundly. And these are just a beginning of some of the different trends, some of those things that are there. So I would argue that that context creates a mandate for three different things. Number one, we have to go from the past changes and why I listed those changes was because they were reactive. 
They were responsive to needs. Sure, more veterans coming home. Sure, we needed to move away from just education degrees to be more complete in our comprehensive approach to education and so on. Today, I'm arguing we need to anticipate and be purpose purposeful and think about dynamic changes. We need, secondly, to work together to create the future. Much like when I was announced as the interim chancellor in April of 2014, where I talked about the hallmark moving forward together, I continue to stress and continue to believe that collaboration is key. It can't be top down. We cannot begin to identify what the specific needs are at the program, at the school college level, at the department, or individual major level is. We wouldn't want to go down that particular path, in my experience, having served as a faculty member here for 20, going on 28 years. Finally, I submit that we need to double down. We need to maintain our R1 status and develop further our strength as the urban research university in Wisconsin. So that's the mandate. And what I'd like to say is here's what we're doing to get there. So with that as a transition, Here's what will sustain our future, activities in these areas. And there's got to be a lot of work across these. This is not by any means a complete picture, but really a framing. I'll talk about enrollment situation. I'll talk about budget progress update. And I'll talk about the request that we have with UW system and investments that have been made in UW system. With respect to enrollment, we don't have the official 16 fall 16 numbers yet. In fact, in the last week alone, they've come up about a percent. Um, I anticipate, and we are hoping, of course, for that trend to continue over the next week. Um, but we have anticipated that we would be down this fall between 3 and 4 percent, and we're in that range right now. Um, that's mainly because of smaller returning classes, but we also saw a drop in the new freshman class, even with the increase in the number of admissions. Our yield is down, but there are some bright spots. We have today almost 400 flex option students. Our summer online undergraduate enrollment rose 7%. 7 and I'll talk more about some highlights in some of the other, other areas uh, in, a, in a moment. We hosted this year for the first time a deep dive retreat with our Chancellor's Enrollment Management Action Team. The first time was where we had on this campus a strategic enrollment management plan that's a comprehensive evaluation, comprehensive set of activities for going forward to help manage our enrollment. This work, CMAT, covered a number of areas, and I highlight five or six of them here. Illinois focus group and recruitment. We've been looking at Illinois for some time. This is one example of a state that's more challenged than we are from a financial perspective in terms of higher education funding. We have received more Illinois students from our efforts than ever before. In fact, this year, our freshman class from Illinois is up 40%. We went from 211 students to 296 in one year. Overall undergraduate growth is up about 37%. We today are at 464 students from Illinois as compared to last year, last fall, 339. We hope that trend continues. We provide an opportunity for Illinois students to achieve, even though it's out of state through our, Milwaukee, through our uh, Midwestern State Exchange Program, it's about one and a half times what our, what our normal um, tuition is. That's still cheaper than most in-state tuition rates in Illinois. So it's very, very attractive and competitive. We're focusing on improving the student experience through a number of different programs, different advising, different technology. We are looking at a significant involvement with uh, growth in international students. We know this is important given the demographics in Wisconsin. We seek to continue to expand our online and flex programs, and we will be making further investments in graduate and high achieving students, student enrollments. These are facilitated by an allocation from central funds of about $1.2 million to support these initiatives. We've also received some additional funds from UW System for some activities which I'll describe in a moment. So our overall focus is really on raising revenues, and that's why I started with this slide. Our number one source of funding is through tuition. If we don't grow this, we can't enable anything else on campus. It's that simple. It's, it's just fundamental. That's why I start with this. Enrollments are generated 
really from three different areas. One is the type of planning that I just talked about here, where we talk about the opportunities that demographics do or do not provide. In one way, we look at one area of particular growth where we see the most substantial growth. It's in Hispanic high school student graduation rates. All other demographic groups will either stay flat or decline over the next decade. We will be seeking, and we announced at the CMAT retreat this year, we will be seeking designation as a Hispanic serving institution. We've had a group of faculty and staff working on this for the last several months, and we'll have a public launch and a public announcement of this later this fall. But it's an important initiative. We have to look at, in addition to the central planning, what happens at every school and college. I've been associated with programs that have seen significant growth at the undergraduate and master's level. One program years ago went from three to five students to 110 over a period of two years with dedicated focus from faculty and administration within a school. I've also seen in one of our schools where another institution in this community opened a new master's program and in one year the enrollment went from, from it, went, it was cut in half. It was a substantial overnight reduction. There are huge implications of this from a revenue perspective. The third level, beyond the central planning, beyond what happens at school and college, is what we do in the classroom. And the impact of that is more evident every day. I bow, I applaud, I am humbled by the incredible job we do educating students. But I also know that if we can do that even more uniformly, if we can do that even better, and every single graduate student says, every single graduate says, this teaching, in addition to the research opportunities, in addition to the community opportunities, the internships, and all the wonderful attributes of UWM, it was the teachers that made the biggest difference in my life. If every graduate can say that, it will do nothing but improve our retention and graduation rates. Those are the three different levels that I'd ask us all to focus on continuously. Budget action and progress, this slide alone could be an hour and a half. I've only got three hours, so I'm not going to spend all my time on this one. But this particular slide has a lot of different content. I'm going to cover it um, top of the waves. I have been giving monthly updates. I will continue to do that. We will share communication about all of these aspects. But I think there's not a tremendous amount new. But I want to recap, if you haven't been reading those updates, and tell you what some of the future plans are. We have, over the last year, reduced expenditures by $31 million. Keep in mind, that's the first year of a two-year biennial budget, and some of those expenses are permanent base. Some of them are one-time. De we've delayed a number of expenditures. We have made some base adjustments, and it has not been easy. The future won't be easy. This is what I was referring to. Integrated Support Services is a group, it involves a group that has been studying four functions, HR, IT, procurement, and our, our um, help me out here, um, our, our finance. I'm always, always missing on one of those, thank you. So these four functions will be um, structured differently, they'll be transformed, and, and there's a large group on campus looking at that with some outside consulting to expedite this, and we anticipate saving funds in that area. Johannes Britz and Robin Van Harpen have been visiting with every school and college on the strategic position control. The strategic position control team is led by APBC Chair Hobie Davis. There are 11 members, four of whom are from the APBC. We have governance and representation from all our governance groups, including students under the uh, uh, classified, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, university staff and uh, academic staff. We have been uh, uh, working with that group to have goals for every school and college by October. On the VC and AVC appointments, our goal was to eliminate, as we announced in April, a reduction in four. We have achieved 3.25 thus far. From limited appointment, our goal was to reduce that by 16. We have achieved 15 so far. We anticipated doing that over the next two years and sometimes longer, so we've made great progress, and we'll continue to see reductions in those areas. On the academic affairs collaboration and cooperation side, Johannes has been having meetings with, and the schools and colleges in the health areas have been meeting over the summer, and they have been working on collaboration and coordination of teaching, joint recruitment and hiring, research collaboration, SPC planning, and other areas. 
Other academic units continue to work on integration, coordination, and final report will be, later, will be done later this semester. On the workload policy and course duplication committee, there has been collaboration to explore, um, collaborate, there's been a group that's working on exploring how we can collaborate and explore better frameworks, better approaches for revenue sharing. And one thing I want to stress across all of these areas is the role of shared governance. I thank the governance groups, I thank especially their, their leadership for stepping up and being involved with a lot of these activities. And they have made a difference and they will continue to be involved and as any recommendations, as any work comes out of any of these activities that are listed here, they will continue to be folded in, whether it's at the school college level or at the overall um, levels for our shared governance groups. We continue to rely and work as collaboratively as possible on these areas. The third area with respect to actions underway deals with our budget requests and investments in UWM. In the August meeting of the Board of Regents, there was approved a $42.5 million commitment for our operating budget. This assumes the restoration of $50 million to our base. This is the lapse that we anticipate being returned. The governor has indicated that he would support that. His budget has not been announced, so anything can happen between now and January of 2017. These requests are aligned at the UW system level with what's called Forward 2020, or 2020 FWD, which is the campus system-wide strategic plan. This strategic plan tries to align what we do across the UW system with needs of the state, needs of students, in areas that can be supported better by base and GPR budget. Within the budget request, as I mentioned earlier, we have a number of projects. They were ranked and rated, evaluated very highly, and we've been working very closely with system for the last several years. And as you can appreciate, a capital budget is long term. We actually have plans out to 2030 with a lot of the needs that we have on our campus. So we have mocked up for every biennial budget where our request would be. Why I mention that is that if we get zeroed out or if we get no significant increases in our capital budget, it simply pushes that whole pipeline back dramatically. So here's the situation for this year. We have five projects. Number one, Northwest Quad. That's the largest of our requests and it's the top priority, renovation of Northwest Quad. We have 880,000 square feet in that set of buildings, that complex across more than 11 acres, but we can't access 550,000 square feet. We have it in mothballs and we need to be able to renovate to open that space up for, frankly, a majority of schools and colleges that will either have surge or permanent space in that building over the next several, several years. So that's a big part of our plan. The other requests are modest in comparison to that, but they're important. We have renovation required for the engineering building, chemistry building, and those are stopgap. Those are not to, to um, remodel in a, in a noticeable way. These are for infrastructural needs that keep us able to teach and do research in those buildings. We also have a request for IT infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier. So those are four what we call general program revenue requests. Separately, a fifth request is a program revenue request, which is for a basketball practice facility. This is funded by the student seg fees. They've voted on this over multiple uh, votes over the years, and they've continued to build funds for that. That's what we call program revenue, where we would borrow against that, but the payment mechanism is uh, from the student seg fees. So that's the, that's the status today. What was pushed back, and what now will be in the 1921 biennial budget, is the new student union building, also a PR project, program revenue, student seg fees for that, and our new chemistry building, which would be the top priority for the 1921 budget. So that's just a snapshot of where we are uh, for that. There has been additional support for UWM from UW system. This is unprecedented. We have received $3.7 million for an investment in advising. We put together a compelling proposal, thanks in large part to Giselle Durham, Johannes Britz, and others in student and academic affairs. It was academic affairs leadership that really has helped bring this together to provide a three-year support for a number of different things that will enhance retention and enrollment through better advising and technology support for that advising. So this involves student affairs, academic affairs, all our units to enhance this. 
This contributes, as I mentioned earlier, to the research and engagement functions because if we get the enrollment up, everything else is enhanced. We also received this year $3.3 million one-time funding for high-need financial aid student opportunities. I mentioned earlier the SAJAC grants, $300,000 this year. Ray Cross, the president of UW System, has committed another $300,000 for next year. We hope that that continues because of the difference that it is making in the community. So those are some examples of the additional support for UWM from UW System. Climate and culture is bedrock. It's foundational. It's about you. It's about all our employees. It's about our students, community members, friends, alumni. But we have to focus even more on this. And with my background, looking at some of these areas in, in a, such an important way, we know we need to do everything that we can and more. I will tell you that our employees as a whole work hard every day, and I'm grateful. I want to thank you for the work that you do. I want to thank you especially in the recent weeks for the welcome back that so many of you as volunteers provided, whether it was with the activities for Unite going into our neighborhoods, whether it was helping students move in, all the welcome activities, dozens of different events. And everything you do has a ripple effect. Everything you do at the individual level really is magnified through the word and the deeds that, that we undertake. The compensation I've talked about in the the recent updates in terms of some of the monthly updates where we are and I mentioned that I would be sharing a final number and I can tell you today that we will be distributing as a lump sum one-time funds of 1.75 percent with a base of 1175 so basically at sixty seven thousand dollars or less it's more than 1.75 and above that it is 1.75 percent those funds come because we had a milder winter than expected, and our fringe benefits we also had paid uh, over with, with the, the headcount that is less across the UW system. So there was a return of those funds that we have to move through pretty quickly, and in that context, we are asking for indications of solid performance. This has to be based on solid performance that we want to distribute in November, so November paychecks. So that's why you're seeing across all the schools and colleges and all our units requests to um, make sure that we have evidence of that, that uh, solid performance. I would rather have done a base budget increase if we could afford that, if that was at all possible, if we weren't in the budget situation we were. But what we have right now is an opportunity to take care of what I consider to be our highest priority, our people. I want to put this in a brief context and tell you that over the last eight years, we've had two 1% exercises. Those were base budget. So this is something that I hope is stopgap. I hope this helps us get to a new pay plan that will be, as I understand, and it's not guaranteed, but I understand that in the December Board of Regents meeting, there will be a request for the state budget to include a base pay plan. I don't anticipate it being more than 1% or 2% per year but that's what I understand is in the works. I, um, I, that's, again, that's my understanding at this point. Beyond that, we are developing and putting on, beginning this fall, programs around professional development topics that include supervisory development, stress management, change management, conflict resolution, and a number of other topics with more information that will come from human resources and your personnel reps. Under the diversity, campus diversity planning, this encompasses a number of areas. First, we are undertaking a complete campus diversity and inclusion strategic plan. We are working today on improving and coordinating the integration of our multicultural student service centers, and we are uh, addressing a number of different uh, points with students around our student coalition on multicultural needs and interests from the student perspective. Joan Prince and Rob Smith are helping lead this work and will be putting together the complete plan and actions this fall. Also on the campus culture and climate category, we have safety and well-being as top priorities. I have stressed a number of times the importance of these areas, and I want to recognize North Health, Norris Health Center as where we have been 
seen a number of programs and a number of great outcomes. A few examples of those. This summer, we had an emergency bioterrorism attack exercise, which had a number of agencies throughout the region that participated, and we were one of the main hosts of that. Everybody who participated, all the municipalities, other districts, were all uh, remarking about how positive and how well prepared things were, were uh, done and how uh, coordinated we were. We have new online sexual violence training modules that are available. We have the Chancellor's Advisory Community Committee on Mental Health, and we have seen positive results focusing on our students in terms of high risk drinking and suicide prevention. Starting this month, as announced yesterday, we're offering 20 sessions on classroom and campus safety for faculty, instructional staff, and others. This stems from much of the training that we have been doing for the rest of the campus, but we've noticed we don't have a lot of individuals from the classroom involved, and we know that that's critically important. These programs, by the way, are open to all of our faculty and staff. So I've covered a tremendous amount of material today. I know it's at a high level, not in a lot of great detail on all these topics, but before I wrap up, I offer a few requests. I've talked a lot about collaboration this afternoon. I can't stress it enough. It's who I am, it's how I think we operate in terms of part of our DNA, and it's the root of shared governance. I think we can accomplish even more if we work together in a focused area. And here are some of the areas that I'd ask you to think about. How do we maintain our research prowess? How do we build even more successfully programs in these areas? What kind of programmatic and curricular focus will keep us as relevant, keep us as attractive as we possibly can be to grow enrollments? And look, I know there are areas that are going to be the same and, and, and they're, they're necessary. They're absolutely critical that they do not change. They're necessary for a comprehensive, complete university education. But there are opportunities and there must be areas where we see tremendous growth opportunities that keep us as, as uh, positive on the growth trajectory as we can. With regard to student interactions, quality educational experiences, I remember, and I haven't brushed up on this in a while, but Jeff, Karen, Jeffrey, you have talked to me and others in biological sciences about things that have been focused on student interactions that I just have dropped my jaws about in terms of above and beyond engagement around advising, spending time on student projects and engagements that really enhance the quality of student interaction. The student feedback is nothing but positive about that special attention. That's an example, but what are the other types of things? I see Nigel, and I think about, Nigel, your work with undergraduate research and the opportunities this summer when you've invited me to spend a little time on working on pizza is the truth, but, but interacting with the students and hearing their experiences. <laughs> I'll, I'll look out my window at any time to get that pizza, but hearing the students' experience and then meeting them during Welcome Week and having them recount their experiences, that's the type of thing that I'm talking about. How do we get more of that embedded into the overall student experience? How can all of us communicate Recognizing we are all ambassadors for this campus in every interaction we have with our family, friends, neighbors, other, other uh, experiences that we have every single day to talk about those stories of impact, things that our alumni have achieved, students, parents, the media, in support of UWM. We have a, a new website that many of you have talked about in terms of how great it is, whether it's from the research side, from the student side, or others. Point people to that. It's, it's just an easy thing to do. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a, at the heart of much of our collaboration. How do we have our school, college, and administrative efforts aligned even more closely with the central planning and the individual faculty and staff work? Those are, those are specific areas and activities that I think we can do more. So let me, if I may, wrap up. By the way, this picture, some of you have probably discerned by now um, what's going on here. These are students from one of the CAP events of the Welcome Week, and many of our administrative leaders uh, joined the students, and we had a short program. And the students did this before they went over to a large dinner uh, on, on a Friday night recently, and they formed the shape of Wisconsin. These are students from Wisconsin, 
And it's remarkable how many of our students stay in Wisconsin, and I think it's great how we were able to do that. Troy, thanks to you for, for a lot of your work helping from the, the vantage that he was to corral uh, quite a few hundred students into to this shape. But it's across the state of Wisconsin as represented by our students that I summarize these ideas. From the talk today, we are the public urban R1 research university focused on students and community. We're the only one. Nobody can or will do this, and nobody certainly can do it as we have done and will do in the future. We need, deserve, and can do more with additional resources. As one of our alumni said in the video, I'm in the fight. Well, we're all in the fight. And I can't praise our efforts enough, and I can't fight hard enough for us to continue to do the things that we're doing. We are facing headwinds. There's no question about that. It's incumbent in that context for us to collaboratively chart new courses. This is not an era such as 1922, 1940s, 1956, where it's simply growth and there's this reaction. We need to do more. We need to be thinking further ahead. And we don't look 60 years ahead necessarily, but let's say five years and 10 years. How do we best position each of our schools and colleges and how do we position ourselves, our departments, our programs, our majors to do what is best? How do we put together research teams that have some of the greatest opportunity for funding in the world today? So, as probably as evident by now, what we do today really does determine where we'll be in the future. That's up to us, it's in our control. And so my final comment is that other campuses with whom I've interacted and seen how they've been dealing with situations in UC Berkeley, they've got a $150 million budget cut in a single budget. I see things happening in Iowa. I see what's going on in Kansas, North Carolina, Texas. I see what's going on in other states. And I'm really proud of how we faced adversity in a very much more collaborative way and how we've connected a lot of dots. We've put a lot of things together. We're not all the way certainly done yet, but I do see us focusing and continuing to stress student outcomes, research, elevation, and ways for us to persevere and have even more impact in the community. I appreciate and I'm grateful for all that you do, for your time here today, and I'm happy to take any questions if you've got them. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, Lane. Thank you. Does this work? I guess it does. So, uh, yeah, th uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, recently in the press, there's been statements about Representative Robin Voss's um, uh, survey that he did, uh, albeit perhaps of dubious methodology, but a survey where he looked at the public programming throughout university system and concluded uh, that it was, uh, you know, far leaning to the left. That is what he called liberal social causes. Um, I'm concerned about this because it seems like perhaps the a kind of exploratory campaign that might be similar in terms of content and programming to the way that they uh, misdirected so much information about the carry forwards uh, in in terms of. Uh, the uh, you know quite ethical way that we were uh, uh, saving budget, but that that became a false controversy that then became part of the narrative to dismantle us through through uh, lack of public funding. So my question to you is: uh, one, is that a concern? And two, if so, what are we doing to get out in front of that narrative? rather than always reacting with like, oh, no, 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 it's not liberal. I, I swear yeah. we have conservative public programming too. So thank you, Lane. Um, your concern is, is um, well placed. I would say that without a doubt. Um, so I got a letter right at the same time this came out from Representative Voss where he sent a letter to me and all the other chancellors and it was um, personalized to each chancellor and, and basically uh, shared what's now in the media. And 
We had heard earlier from an open records request that there was a, a, a information being sought from every campus with regard to, to who were the speakers that were brought in and, and, and the funding sources for them. His staff put together over the course of the summer a report. I haven't seen the report, I haven't seen their data, um, but we are asking and immediately when I got that I asked our team to get two things. One is what is the information that we provided and two, let's get that report and understand where he's coming from. I immediately responded, and separately you should know, that I've been meeting with every legislator, especially those in key leadership positions throughout the summer. I've been doing this since I've been in this role, but especially in anticipation of the budget, um, have met a lot with individual legislators this summer. I actually have on the schedule for October a meeting with Representative Voss, and I told Representative Voss in my letter back to him that I will cover completely the, the data at, at uh, that time, and we will talk about the balanced perspective. I think you can appreciate on this campus in terms of the public representatives that we've had. Um, we've had everybody from Trump to Clinton to Sander. We have Ron Johnson on campus. We have um, uh, Tammy Baldwin. We cover in a lot of public venues a, a very diverse uh, set of, of speakers. Now, he has identified UWM as having the largest amount of funds in in all the different campuses, um, so, so this is a particular concern to me and why I need that data. Absent that data, I can't shoot back and say, oh, no, 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 that's not us. I, I really need to understand categorically what's going on. I also need to clarify with him, if he's talking about faculty workshops or if he's talking about pure open venues, the, the way the story is, is, is described. So I'm on it and um, I will keep you apprised uh, every opportunity as we get this information in. Um, but I, I have the same concern that you do. Um, yes, Pradeep. <clears throat> yes. Solve the budget problem with the overhead and the challenge to how to maintain the R1. It is a great matter of pride that we did achieve the R1 status, but uh, you know, with, with dec declining budgets, it could yeah. be a difficult thing to maintain it and then yeah. to move up within yeah. the R1, how can we move up? Yeah. I'd like so, to know your thoughts. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's something that we are figuring out and we're working on as, with the campus as a whole. We've got individuals from our, our research excellence team that have put forward a number of key priorities and um, we've had some discussion about those in past budget meetings and we'll bring those forward. We have to, to look at uh, one fact. We achieved R1 designation um, over the last 60 years with an awful lot of dedicated effort. We have to preserve those efforts, and as we go through strategic position control, as we go through all the other types of, of budget cuts that we're going through, how do we preserve and how do we rely upon our leadership, faculty, staff, to understand what are the, what are the most important areas for us to retain the key faculty, and so what you've seen over the last year is where we have um, key faculty that, that have always been, and, and this is a good thing, that we have so much talent that other places want it. There's no question we have, we have that, but we have more vulnerability today because we don't have as many means. But we've been aggressively providing counter offers. We've been very successful at keeping a lot of those key faculty, um, continuing with the RGI investments, continuing to earmark and keep graduate student support high. Um, the allocation of that has been a huge priority. So those are some of, the, some of the areas in which we've done this. We need to do more, there's no question about it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mark, I, I really want to thank you for uh, your continued uh, uh, efforts to maintain our R1 status and uh, to uh, grow our institution. I, I do want to uh, reinforce the point that Lane made regarding what appears to be a renewed uh, attack on our institution by Representative Voss and some of his colleagues. Um, I, th I think it might be helpful to remind them that right at the geographic uh, center of our campus is the Lubar Business School. So, you know, we haven't established uh, any kind of new attempt to create an international or, um, um, you know, any kind of left-wing conspiracy. Right on Kenwood Avenue, we're going to be opening up this uh, Center for Entrepreneurship. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think this is just a, a fairly transparent um, effort to intellectually bully us. Yeah. And it's intellectually dishonest. Yeah. Now, we just saw with the data dump that The Guardian did regarding the John Doe investigation that the Wisconsin GOP uh, was scheming on, on any number of levels. I mean, one of which was 
to uh, uh, actually try and uh, you know, gin up stories about voter fraud in advance of the election in order to uh, sway public opinion in their direction. So we know they play these games. We have the documentation that they do it. I know that you have to be careful how you engage them, but at the same time, uh, I think we also need to uh, make it in some way evident that we, we know what they're up to and the public needs to understand this as well. The, the other point that I, I would uh, suggest is that while I really appreciate your efforts to address issues such as uh, faculty compensation uh, and, and you are retaining some good faculty, we also know that we've lost some key faculty, uh, that our salaries on an inflation adjusted basis are declining, they continue to decline, mm -hmm. even though last year median family incomes rose by 5.2%, our incomes dropped, they will continue to drop. 1% increases represent inflation-adjusted declines. It, it, it just can't be sustained. We're going to keep losing good people, and we risk losing our R2 status if the situation continues. I, I know that it's, you, uh, if you had the agency to, to actually correct the situation yourself, of course you would, yeah. but I, I think we, we need to think more about yeah. how we manage public opinion and bring them around to yeah. uh, an understanding of the great value that we impart. And of course, the new web page and, and many other things contribute to that, but we need to keep working in that direction. Yeah, thank you so much. You, both your points are, are right on. I couldn't agree with you more. On the first one, let me talk just uh, one additional uh, fact that, that shows you, you know, how I want to, to embrace and engage this issue. We have um, a program that happens every year. We do an awful lot, as you know, uh, with veterans on this campus. And um, two years ago, Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish joined us because we had invited Governor Walker um, to participate in an event called Serving Those Who Serve. This year, um, my entire cabinet will be participating and we put our aprons on and it's just a wonderful event. Serving those who serve is, is an important activity. We've opened it up to the community. It's not just for our students. And by the way, we have twice as many veterans as any other academic institution in the state and we have a legacy of doing that. We have more than any six state region. This program, um, I've, I will be invited, I laid out this morning, um, we're re-inviting Scott Walker and uh, Lieutenant Governor Clayfish will also be inviting uh, Representative Voss, so he hasn't received that yet, that invitation, but I want him to see the work that we do, and he will, when he's here on campus, he will learn more about the balanced perspective that we provide. I, I, I will tell you, this is not a surprise to me. When I'm in Washington, D.C., and I meet with virtually all of the Republican congressional representatives, this is a question that I'm asked all of the time. It's happened in Madison as well. So there has been this question about how balanced an exposure do um, students get on our campus. So this, this, is, this is part of that uh, perspective. On the pay front, here's the situation that I think we all face. Um, in, in light of budget cuts, rep recognizing that every quarter percent is about half a million dollars to our base budget, so let me just make sure we're clear on that. It basically costs us our base budget for a 1% raise across the campus. It costs us $2 million to our base budget. So in an era where we've been cutting the budget, it's hard to simultaneously increase the base budget for compensation. So here's the dilemma. And, and one of the things that, that I will go down the path of, and that is ultimately proposing to the campus that we cut our budget even further so that those who are here have a base budget increase. I mean, it's that trade-off. In other words, to worsen the deficit spending, worsen, go into deeper cut mode to, to support a, a, a compensation increase. Now, there is a campus that has done that, and our director of HR, um, Tim Danielson, associate vice chancellor for HR, was at Oshkosh. And Tim, I don't want to put you on the spot, but let me put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that in the UW system, not only in your time there, but even today in my discussions with their chancellor, they have uh, continued to really look carefully at market pay and look at trying to really help those with the largest gap. In other words, from a comprehensive study, which we have completed, by the way, we have a good sense of both across faculty and staff what our gaps are and really working to try to bring those that are the farthest away from market equity into to alignment. And how they've done it is on a budget that is no healthier than virtually any other campus, but they have taken and made bigger cuts in some areas in order to, to do that. That is, a, that is a, 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 if you will, a very strategic direction. It is a, a very clear commitment 
And that's, that's the question that's in front of us, and I'm ready to go down that path. It will be harder, it'll make our budget cuts more difficult, but it will be more rewarding for those that are here. Tim, did I get that right? Is that essentially the gist of what they've done? Yeah. And they're exemplary in the UW system for having done that. So that's, that's how, that's a lever. I can't control the UW system, and this is what I've learned in my time here, is that as much as I want to and have fought for, and I can tell you we have legislative support and a lot of local support to enhance UWM in terms of base allocation funding, and we're going to be, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, doing, doing well and better in that regard, but we can't, we're part of a system, and as part of a system, I, you know, you can't, you can't get significantly more uh, you know, in, in, in terms of, of trying to, to um, uh, get an increase just for one campus's compensation. So it really has to pay especially as is, is done across the board, generally across the campuses. So, Anish. Thank you, Chancellor Morney. Uh, I Thank think you've you been doing a wonderful work. Uh, this, I want to propose a different route to Lane's question in answering the question. I think when the data comes out, it's quite likely that liberal worldview was, you know, by far, you know, uh, represented more on campuses. But the question in universities is not about democracy of perspectives, but actually it's the democracy of people. So if there is a scientific or social scientific consensus from climate change to mass incarceration, for example, or world peace, so the, when the consensus ha has emerged, it's quite likely that those perspectives will be more valued and they will be given more stage on these campuses. So it, it's not possible to have every perspective get the same weight. It's, it's a weighted analysis in our case. So that's one of the ways we can actually respond to such attacks on who we invite, uh, whether we have the freedom to invite. Uh, the kind of people we want to invite. Yeah. So you're identifying, this is self-identification of the committee that's going to help me with my response to Representative Voss. <laughs> so so uh, anybody else? Uh, and I am, I am only partly joking. I'm serious. I, I really do need your input. You, you've got great ideas, and we need to marshal all our, all our best thoughts on this. So thanks, Anish. I, 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 I get it. Any other questions? I know we've got a faculty senate meeting that uh, we roll right into here, but um, any other questions? I will see you then at the faculty senate meeting. Thank you again for your comments and questions today. Thank you, Thank you Chancellor Mone. We will now convene the faculty meeting in room, I believe, 250.